Good evening. Welcome you to the 10th segment of our look at the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be in uh, the ninth chapter of Nehemiah. Look at a little portion of that and also uh, dip our toe into the great New Testament chapter, the third, uh, third chapter of Romans. A little bit as we look at two views of patience, and so uh, we're we're studying about patience in this session. And you know, if you received a grade in patience, would it be a passing one? I heard about a man who prided himself on being extremely, exceedingly punctual. He fol he followed a very precise routine every morning. His alarm went off exactly at 6.30 a.m. every day. He would rise briskly. He would shave. He would shower. He would eat his breakfast, uh, brush his teeth, pick up his briefcase, go to his car, uh, drive to the nearby ferry landing, park his car, ride the ferry across to the downtown business area, get off the ferry, walk very briskly to his building, march to the elevator, ride it to the 17th floor, uh, hang up his coat, open his briefcase, spread his papers out on his desk, and sit down in his chair at precisely 8 a.m., not 8.01, and not even 7.59, always at 8 a.m. And he followed this same routine without variation for eight years until one morning his alarm did not go off and he overslept 15 minutes. So when he did awake, of course, he was in a panic and he rushed through his shower. He cut himself as he shaved. He gulped down his breakfast. He only halfway brushed his teeth. He grabbed up his briefcase. He jumped into his car. He sped to the ferry landing, jumped out of his car, and looked for the ferry. And there it was, out in the water, a few feet from the deck and from the dock. And he said to himself, I think I can make it. And he ran down the dock towards the ferry at full speed, reached the edge of the pier, and when he did, he gave an enormous leap out into the water and, and miraculously landed with a loud thud on the deck of the ferry. The captain rushed down to make sure he was all right, and the captain said, man, that was a tremendous leap, but if you could have just waited another minute we would have reached the dock and you could have walked on. Heard another story about patients. There was this uh, family of turtles. So there was father turtle and mother turtle and junior turtle. And they decided to go on a picnic. As you can imagine, they didn't move very fast, so it took them three years to get to the picnic grounds. They got all the, the food unpacked from the picnic basket and suddenly realized that they had left the ketchup at home. Mother Turtle asked Junior Turtle if he would run home and get the ketchup. Junior Turtle didn't want to do that. He was afraid that his dad and mom would start eating without him. His dad and mom promised that they would not begin their picnic until Junior returned from home with the ketchup. Well, Father Turtle and Mother Turtle waited for Junior Turtle. They waited for years. Five years passed and no sign of Junior. They waited some more. Nine years passed, and they could wait no longer. They, they just had to eat something. So each one of them took one little bite. And as soon as 
Father Turtle and Mother Turtle took their first bite. Junior Turtle burst out from behind a bush and screamed, I knew you'd start eating without me. I'm not going. Well, two sort of different approaches to patience, right? Uh, you can sort of pick the one that, that fits you better. In a similar way, there are two points of view about patience when it comes to God and us. God looks at patience one way, and we usually look at it another. Now, I want us to think for a moment of our typical view of patience. If we had to draw an illustration, a picture of our thoughts and feelings when patience is called for in our lives, what would that picture contain? Now, maybe we've been having to practice that a lot recently as we've been through this strange period in our lives. But if you had to draw a picture of of something that depicted your view of patience when it was required, what would you draw? Might, might you draw clenched teeth um, or a picture of people waiting in a long line or grimacing or frustration or being right on the edge of losing it? Uh, when, when you have to be patient, how do you normally feel? Well, it probably depends on the situation, and I realize that. And patience, I suppose, is to be commended uh, regardless of how we feel about it while we're being patient. Uh, we realize that, that God calls us to be patient, and sometimes it's probably all we can do to just be patient let alone to have the perfect attitude about it, right? So, uh, let's just all admit it. Sometimes our patience is mediated through clenched teeth, and we're sort of grinning and bearing it all the way. And this is one of the clearest places where we see the difference between our heart and the heart of God. God has a different view of patience than we often do. And we can learn a lot about God by just considering those two different views. And we can find some important places where we can really improve ourselves and become more like God, more godly, and more like our Savior just want to, again, look at a couple of passages, of course, one in Nehemiah, but one also in the New Testament, and hopefully to demonstrate for you how different God's patience is from ours and how we can be more like God. So the first text, again, is in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, and it's interesting what's happening in this particular chapter of the book. Basically, the people of God are renewing their relationship or their covenant with God. And they're all together in assembly, and they've sort of confessed and mourned over their sin, and they've read from the Word of God. In fact, they've done so for six hours. And uh, it's sort of a quarter of the day they have spent reading uh, from the Word of God. And then it says that they go on and they worship for another six hours. So reading from the Bible uh, for six hours and worshiping for six hours. Uh, just that in itself would have required patience, I'm sure. And so uh, in, in this particular chapter, we have a record of some of the things that they confessed at this time and, and some of the things they prayed for and some of their words of worship. And over in verses 16 through 21 of this chapter um, is, is where I want us to, to, to focus our thoughts. The people there in that little paragraph talk about all the sins and the mistakes that they and their ancestors 
ancestors had made as a people. Uh, it's sort of like a group confession. And one of them, one of the sins, frankly, is that they were not a very patient people, and they didn't wait on God, and they didn't, uh, they didn't wait on God's timing of things. And so uh, I want to ask you to be patient for a moment and listen to these words that they spoke to God in, in Nehemiah chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 16, and see what they say there says, But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They're speaking to God here. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf, and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt, and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart for them, by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, to light for them the way that they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. So you see this uh, confession that's being made in Nehemiah's day sort of reflecting back on the people of God during the period of the Exodus. If ever there was a glaring contrast between God and his people, you have it confessed there in that text. You remember why it was that the people were upset and stiff-necked and wanted to go back to Egypt, and why they made this golden calf uh, to worship when they were at Mount Sinai. They just could not wait, could not wait on God. They could not exercise spiritual patience. So remember how it transpired there in Exodus. Moses goes up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, he goes up there to commune with God and to receive the law, the tablets from God. And he's gone for 40 days. And that's way too long for these people. Now you think about it, how long have we been in shutdown, quarantine? Longer than that. But 40 days was too long for them on that occasion to be without Moses and without the direction they sought from God. A few months of moving through the wilderness to the promised land was too long for these people. Uh, no ability to demonstrate patience amongst uh, these people who had been rescued from slavery in Egypt and, and were being brought to a new land that God had promised to them. But in this very same text, do you hear and did you notice the description of God? What did it say of God? In verse 17, Nehemiah 9, it says this, But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. And the people, as they, they speak these words, the people of Nehemiah's day, much later than the Exodus, uh, they go on, they talk about how God did not forsake them in the wilderness, despite all their rebellion and unfaithfulness. He kept feeding them and leading them and watering them. They lacked nothing. 
during all this time. Not that it wasn't difficult, but they didn't lack for food or water or protection. It even says that their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. God was really uh, taking care of them. Why would that be, despite the way they behaved? Because God is really so different from us. Uh, he is a God that is ready to forgive, in fact, eager to forgive. And he's gracious and merciful. And he's really slow to get angry. It's hard to God to, to, to make God angry. He's slow to anger. And he's full of love. And in particular, for what we're talking about, God likes being patient. Now think about that. God likes being patient. He wants to be patient. He doesn't have to bite his divine tongue or clench his divine teeth when he exercises patience. He loves every minute of it. God loves to be patient. That's the way he wants to be. It's, it's really amazing. Um, and it's hard for me to find anything that makes a good comparison. You know, when we um, remember different times uh, driving home from vacation, going to the beach and driving home from vacation, at least the place we went, uh, and the time of year we went, it, it seemed to always be a traffic jam when we were driving back, and probably it will be again next time. And uh, I can remember one traffic jam just sitting for an hour. I'm sure you've experienced worse ones than that. But I can remember one time it took an hour to go 10 miles. And I guess I was patient, but barely. Um, I didn't enjoy it, I didn't like it, I didn't want it, I wasn't happy about it, you know, but what could I do? Uh, the situation demanded that, that I, I'd be patient. And I think about that in comparison to God. Imagine if when I came up on the traffic jam, you know, usually you can see those things coming from the distance, you can see the back up in traffic. Imagine coming up on something like that and it just delighting you. you know, oh, another chance to sit still. Isn't it just lovely? I, I've looked forward to this all day and just sort of celebrating the opportunity to be patient. Well, it sounds ridiculous. And it really is a, a ridiculous comparison to God's patience, but I don't have anything better. God wants to be patient with his people. He desires to be. And, and so he is so different, isn't he, than me and you. And uh, we really ought to be so thankful that he is. We would all be in such a world of hurt if God were not so different from us. Well, there's one other text that helps me understand this and grasp it a little bit more and, and reflect on it. And it's the one we referred to earlier. It's the New Testament. It's a great chapter in the New Testament, uh, Romans chapter 3. And a lot of great depth in that chapter. Um, but I just want to read a few verses from that chapter and, and set it beside what we looked at in Nehemiah. Paul writing to the Romans, chapter 3, beginning of verse 21. He says this, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 
and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. So, you know, less we think that this is just an Old Testament idea we're discussing. It most certainly is not. Paul writes there in Romans 3 and in verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So now we're not just talking about ancient Israel in the wilderness, but all of us. All have done the same kinds of things that Israel did. All of us have been stubborn and stiff-necked, and all of us have rebelled and sinned and, in effect, worshipped other gods, whatever the sin might be. And so all, in that sense, stand condemned based on their sin. But that little word, all, applies not only to the phrase, all have sinned, but also to the next one that comes in verse 24, Romans 3. Because it says there, and all are justified by his grace as a gift. In other words, all are justified by God's grace. How is that? Verse 24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, it's true, all have sinned, and all are justified by God's grace, which was generated in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 25, in reference to Jesus, it says, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So when we say all are justified by his grace as a gift, we don't mean all in the sense of 100% of all people of all time. No. All, the, all those who have received God's gift of grace by faith, that's the all that is being discussed. But notice the rest of the verse, Romans 3.25, and here's where it links up with what we've been discussing all along. Why is it that God did this? It says there, this was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. What was that? He had passed over former sins. He had left sins unpunished? Yes. Why? Because God wants to be patient. God loves to be patient. It pleases God to show patience. And so he waited and he waited for centuries, for millennia, before sins were really punished. What do I mean by that? Those sins of former times and really all sin of all time, were punished in Jesus Christ on the cross. God knew that was going to happen. You know, when, for instance, the people at Mount Sinai are right there in the presence of God are building a golden calf and bowing down to it and saying, this is our God who brought us out of Egypt. God knew that those sins would be punished. Now, they were going to be uh, punished in the very short term um, in, in Moses' day. As you read that story, it happens. But in a permanent sense, really those sins being dealt with, God knew 
Um, that wasn't going to take place for centuries. And he was going to wait. And he did. He waited. That's a good thing that I wasn't God in that situation. And I imagine it was a good thing you weren't God. I doubt we'd have waited. I doubt that we could have passed over sins uh, that, that, you know, if we were in the place of God and the sins were against us, I doubt we could have passed over sins for that long. And I'm, I'm sure we couldn't have done it with love in our hearts and in the right spirit. No way. I'm not like that about waiting in traffic. Are you? But God's like that. Praise God. He's like that. And if I wish to be more like God, patience is not a bad place to start. To start working on being more like him. You see, I don't know if you've thought about this before, but patience is at the very heart of the good news of the gospel. Right here in Romans 3, that divine forbearance, that's God's patience. It is at the center of of the story of the cross, that God could watch them do that to his son. And so, let us all uh, learn to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured, was patient, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Two views of patience. And what great things we can learn from God's view of it. May God bless you today. And may, may we all learn to be more like Him.